have a ninth meeting of the Police and Municipal Building Campus Building Committee. As a preliminary matter, this is Patrick Pitney, Chairman. Please permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Maurice DiPaolo. Present. Kristen Lass. Keith Baldinger. Present. Holly Luke. Present. Chief Anderson. Present. Justine Snyder. Patrick Collins. Joseph Morrow. Present. Very good. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Kevin Mizikar. Present. Angela Snell. Alexandria Martinez. Present. Anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. Matt Salad. Present. Jeff McElravey. Present. Neil Joyce. Present. Kevin Griffin. This open meeting of the Police and Municipal Campus Building Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of, open meeting law, of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. For this meeting, the Police and Municipal Campus Building Committee is convening by Google Hangout as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer unless asked by the chairperson or the staff person. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to assure, ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each board or staff member who has the lead role for the particular item or speaker associated with the item on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members first and then to staff members, inviting each by name to provide any comment or questions. I will then call upon the members to offer a motion and then for a second. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Remember that unless a document is being shared, your camera feed is triggered by your speaking or background noise. To mute and unmute your telephone, dial star six. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For others in attendance that are expected to present, please hold until your name is called to present. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Remember that unless a document is being shared, your camera feed is triggered by your speaking or background noise. To mute and unmute your telephone, dial star six. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. After your presentation, members of the committee will be given the opportunity to ask questions. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Has anybody else joined us that I did not call when I started this um, script? Kristen, are you in? Justine, Patrick? No, not yet. Okay, we have a quorum, so we can proceed. So moving to the agenda, we have the minutes of August 24th, 2020. Any discussion or do we have a motion? Uh, 
I, I move we accept the minutes of the last meeting. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of August 24th, 2020. Please respond with your vote when I call your name. Maurice DePaulo? Aye. Keith Baldinger? Aye. Holly Luke? Aye. Kevin Anderson? Aye. Joseph Morrow? Aye. Patrick Pitney? Aye. So that's recorded as 6 0 to approve the minutes. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is we have um, we have a bill for Shrewsbury Police Detail to control traffic for survey work, $192. Uh, we all have a copy of that in our attachments. Any discussion around that? Very good. Is there is that is that um, is that work now completed? That traffic that survey work. Yes, I believe the vast majority of it is. We were doing it in-house uh, with town staff. Uh, with, and uh, I think we have everything that we need at this point. Okay, very good. Thanks, Mr. Manager. All right, anything else on, the, on this um, item? Do we have a motion? Do we have a motion to approve this invoice? I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, motion to approve the invoice. Thank you very much. Do we have a second? Chief Anderson, I'll second that. Thank you, Chief. Okay, when I call your name, please cast your vote. Maurice DePaulo? Aye. Keith Baldinger? Aye. Holly Luke? Aye. Kevin Anderson? Aye. Joseph Morrow? Aye. Patrick Pitney? Aye. So, again, that's... Approve, approval of that invoice, six to zero. And next we're on to the review the feasibility design for town hall and the senior center. Matt, are you taking this one or who's up? Yes. I All right, will, very good. Uh, I'll share my screen now. Dogs approved too. So, um, okay. So we're going to cover. We're going to go over three items uh, on the agenda today. We're going to go over an updated conceptual design for the um, Council on Aging, um, revised conceptual design and updated um, elevations and perspectives of the second floor addition for the town hall, um, and then there was some <clears throat> uh, data that we put together on the. Uh, Police headquarters budgeting, along with comparisons of other communities throughout the Commonwealth. Um, after that, I do have the um, three budget slides that we presented last week. We can go over those again and look and look into them in more detail if needed. Otherwise, we can just talk about uh, these three items. So we'll start with the COA. Um, we haven't made any revisions to the floor plan except for. We added a set of columns in the Porco share. Um, aesthetically and structurally, it was a fairly long span to, to not have a, a middle support. So what we'll do is create um, an island in the middle of that drop-off drive and uh, drop a couple of columns there. Um, other than that, the floor plans have, have remained the same. Um, these are the exterior elevations. Um, so uh, again, here's the, the port cochere at, at the front entry. This is the south elevation um, facing the, the current main entry. Um, so this is the new vestibule that we're adding off to the, the, the west. Um, and other, other than that, this elevation is, is essentially remaining the same. Uh, we wanted to keep the, the port cochere um, presence down, uh, I think we showed it in the past as a, as a larger mass, so we, we brought that down. Um, and uh, we wanted to keep the, the, the roof lines um, similar to what there is existing as well. Um, on the other side is the, the north elevation. Um, again, you can see where the addition is popping out for the, the backside of that new vestibule. This is where the, the veteran support office would be um, and the backside of the Porto share. 
Um, one of the requests was to make the, um, the multi-purpose space, the main dining room, a little bit more open and inviting. So um, what you'll see in here in some of the subsequent elevations is some of the larger windows that we're adding to the rear and to the east elevations of that. So opening that space up, having a little bit more indoor-outdoor um, connection and a little bit more natural light entering that space. Uh, and then we are also adding that second means of egress off to the north. Um, so that there's two means of egress out of that space when the folding partition is closed. Um, to the west, this is the new main entrance to the building. So we're looking underneath the port cochere here to the second um, set of double doors going into the vestibule. Uh, we're having a large window that, that reflects the, the other windows that we're adding to the rest of the building into that vestibule space. So as you, as you sequence into the building, it's, it's more open and inviting um, and gives you a little bit of a sense of entry. Uh, and then this is a window into the new um, veteran support office that's just off of that lobby. Um, just balancing this entrance a little bit, we did have an opportunity here for some um, for potential signage, marquee, something like that to announce different events that are going on um, week by week. Um, so there's an opportunity um, there. Um, and then around to the other side to the east elevation, uh, again, just bringing those larger windows into that, into that space, uh, that, that uh, multi-purpose space to, to connect the interior and the exterior and bring a little bit more natural light in there. Um, we kept the rhythm of all these to, to sort of reflect the one large existing window that's up here on the south elevation to the current um, mixed use space library and, and, and things like that. So we wanted to sort of keep that consistent throughout the, the building. Um, so we can discuss this a little bit more when we open it up for discussion. Um, Holly, I, I see you raising your hand. Did you have a question? I do. I do have one question, Matt. Um, looking at the south elevation um, photo, the is that an opening for like, cars to supposed to like drive under, or is that just? So my only question with that is with that it doesn't in my head it doesn't appear that it would fit our COA bands underneath there. It doesn't appear that it would be high enough. That's my only. That's my only concern. So yeah, so right now the the sort of lowest point that we're showing here is is uh is around a little over ten feet. I think it's ten foot six. Um, so it should fit most um, bands. I think if we need to raise it up a little bit, we can certainly do that. Um, there's there's some ways that we can match some of the building lines and still elevate that a little bit further. Um, I believe. Uh, do you know what what the make and model is on that? Off the top of your head. Uh, I don't. We have two different model vans, um, and I don't know that. I don't know them off the top of my head. Okay. Um, just at, at that say, point. I'm sorry. I, I think they're Fords for sure, and I want to say they're E43 or E53 or something like that. But I can, I can definitely send you that information. Okay. Perfect. And, and we'll make sure we have plenty of clearance for that. Um, if we if we've accommodated it, great. If not, we'll. Um, we'll make some revisions to make sure we capture that. I know we've discussed it in the past and I, and I think we're good, but it's, it's certainly worth a second look. So Matt, this is, this is Pat Pitney. Um, I have a question around the same area. Um, yeah. with, with the addition of the middle column and with the height concerns, what about, and I think I've asked this before, what about getting emergency vehicles in there and maybe, um, maybe Chief Anderson can weigh in on this as well. If somebody needs to, if we need to pull a vehicle right up to that spot, is that going to be possible? Um, we can, we can, at the same, at, to the same point, we can make sure that it fits um, an ambulance. Um, fire, for a fire truck, fire apparatus, something like that, um, we, we planned the site, we pulled a couple of parking spaces back so they'd swing around on, on the other, uh, other drive in. Um, that's more of a direct route into the space. So if they were coming around the back, they'd be able to go that way instead of going underneath um, the Porco share. Okay. Um, but as far as getting an ambulance under there, um, trying to think what an ambulance height is with the light bar off the top of my head, I think it'll fit, but we'll make sure that we, we accommodate that as well. Thank you. 
Anything else since we have questions out there? And I see um, just for the for the minutes, Alexandria, I see Mr. Collins has joined us as well. Welcome, Pat. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late. No worries. Um, okay, if there's nothing else at the moment, we can always circle back to it. Um, and I'll move on to the, oh, did have one more image. So this is the, just a perspective, um, sort of looking at uh, from town hall, looking at the senior center. So now we'll move on to the, the town hall second floor edition. Um, we haven't really changed the floor plans since the last time, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on those, but what we haven't shown previously is the lower level floor plan and how that affects, how that's affected by the second floor addition. Um, so if you crawl on the second floor, we had a, a, a new elevator coming up. This is how it would relate to the lower level. Um, this is where the stair would come down. Um, so this would be your new main, your new entry through this part of the building. There'd be a secondary lobby here um, because this stair is exiting into the lobby and it's part of our egress, this lobby is going to be part of our exit access. So it needs to be separated. It needs to have a fire separation from the rest of the building. So we're, le we're putting, we're leaving the existing, uh, interior vestibule doors here. They'd be replaced with fire doors. Um, those can be on hold opens and just close if there is an emergency, but that way we have a continuous um, rated egress from the second floor without causing too much disruption to the, to the, the first floor. Um, on the second floor, because what we're doing with this scheme after the last time we met is we're, we're looking at keeping the new structure for the second floor interior to the existing um, footprint. So we'll be doing some, some cutting and patching of the slab to get some new footings and columns and things like that in the interior. Um, but because we're not spanning over the existing structure with this, we're not going to have to really deal with that elevation change from the existing second floor to the new second floor. Um, so we're not gonna have stairs and we're not gonna have a disconnect here between the public facilities office and um, and the education department. So we'll have a continuous hallway connecting the two of them. And that allows us to, to continue what we had shown originally with some of those shared spaces, like this conference room and those in the shared restrooms that would be out here. Um, other than that, the floor plan is, is still much the same as it was when we had pre presented it previously. Um, so some of the elevations, this is the south elevation looking at the existing front of the building. Um, you can see the addition off to the back. We're matching the, the existing roof lines and we're bringing in the existing um, fascia height to match uh, the front main portion of, of, the, uh, of the elevation. Um, we did bring in um, that um, fencing um, detail that goes around the, mans the low mansard roof just to sort of tie those um, vocabularies together a little bit. And then this bump out here is where that new addition will, will poke out where the lobby and stair and elevator will be below. Um, this is the west elevation. So we're looking at the, the new entryway here. So again, this is where the stair and elevator would be. Um, we're matching the, the windows in the window detailing and, and, and vocabulary that's down on the lower level uh, to break up the, the Vertical mass of the brick we're bringing in below the, um, the existing window line, we're bringing a, a sort of a double soldier course that would, that would march along and bring a little horizontal band around there to sort of break up that elevation. Um, and then we're articulating the corners of the new addition just so it has a little bit more prominence to the, to the rest of the, um, the mass behind it with sort of an express coin at the corners. They would, they're showing sort of flat here um, but they would they would be more of an expressed um, uh, larger scale coin to the corners like you would have on the on the, you sort of have it, it, the front of the building existing currently. Um, at the stair and at the main entry, we we'd look to have a uh, full height curtain wall, uh, and then that also comes around, and you'll see it on the on the north elevation as well, so that we get some some natural light in it, and it really expresses that entry and gives a little bit little bit more of a modern feel to, to this new addition portion of the building. 
Um, so along the north, uh, we're replicating the window rhythm again down below. You can see how the roof line is, is reflective of the existing roof line and then stops short. So we'd have another mansard condition on the second floor. Um, and, and again, that, that curtain wall that sort of separates the, the mass that's reflective of the existing building that's being brought up to a second floor and, and the new addition off to the, to the west. And this is the east elevation. So at the Selectman's meeting room, um, there's, a, there's a little bump out and um, some trim that's articulated here. So we're actually gonna extend that up. Right now it extends up to the, to the fascia line that runs along here. We're gonna extend that up to the, uh, to the soldier course so that it sort of ties um, those horizontal elements in vertically with that bump out. Uh, and then again, we're, we're bringing up the, um, the same rhythm of the windows from down below. Um, this pediment and, um, and, and bump out and trim that's, that's at this east entry um, into the building is, is, is currently there. So we're just sort of keeping that. We'll have to rework the, that pediment roof line as we tie it into the new addition, but we'd look to keep that um, so it sort of has sort of a similar feel to what's there existing. Um, and then we just have some perspectives marching along the building. So this would be along um, Maple Ave as you come in uh, the East Drive. Um, it, you can see the, the new addition popping out to the back, but it's much more subdued than it was at the previous, um, the previous presentation. The, the massing has been brought down significantly and, and it sort of fits in with the existing roof lines a little bit more uh, cleanly. This is looking sort of it from the um, the entrance to the existing police station. And again, you can, you can just sort of make out the addition coming off to the back. Little indication that there's something new happening back there and a little bit, a, a little reflection of the new mass, but um, it's, it's sort of um, taking, a, taking a back uh, step to, to the existing building massing. So it really allows this to, to play itself up sort of as the historical uh, mass of the building. And then as we, as we come around to the new parking area that we, we, we would create, the new entryway starts to present itself and, and, um, and, and starts to stand it by itself and, and really represent an entry to the, to the building. And then again, to the Northwest, looking back. Um, so we can certainly take comments on this, any thoughts, or we can, we can save it to the end. <clears throat> Any thoughts? All right. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we have a question out there, Demo. Uh, man, I, I, I don't know if I misunderstood you or not. Do you say that that addition second floor is going to be the same height as the existing second floor? Yes, that's what we're planning on. Obviously, um, as we get into more detailed study, um, the way that the, the structural depths and things are going to start tying together when we get into that real nitty gritty detail of it, you know, maybe we have to bump it up a little bit and there'd be a, a small ramp or a step, a step or two. But right now we're anticipating trying to keep those floor heights at, at the same height. I, 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 maybe I missed up the last meeting, but how are you doing that? I, I thought we were going over the top of the building. So this is this is looking at the structure as um, internal to the building rather than um, building out and spanning over. So what we had, what we've discussed, um, we had a we had a working session where we discussed uh, about a, a little over a week ago. Um, you know. Rather than rather than span over the building, because the idea there was that we were going to reduce disruption uh, on the lower level, reduce the impact, and reduce the construction time. We're still going to be doing all those impacts. So you know, if if say it, it costs a little bit less and it gives us a better result at the end of the day, and it takes three more months to to construct this, and maybe there's a little bit more cost associated with that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we get a better building and a better product by doing that. Let's explore looking at not spanning over the existing structure and doing whatever modifications internally to the facade that we need to do to make it work where the floor heights are the same height. So that's what we were exploring um, with this. And, and that's 
that's really the only way that we could bring that mass and scale of it down without scale without spanning over what we have currently. Okay. I, I think it I think it's great if you can do that. Um, I like that a lot better. So um, thanks for at least looking at that and trying it. And when we when we look at producing the budget on these two, we're going to look at both options to see what the delta and the impact really is on the budget. So we'll, we'll be able to weigh those. Okay, very good. Any other thoughts out there? I know there was some con concern about the massing. I know um, I was a little bit less concerned with the massing, but when I see this rendition of it, um, I really like this one much better. Everything looks clean and, and seamless. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see the cost comparisons on the two designs. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, Matt, for, for me and Jeff, uh, um, I certainly like this a lot better than the original um, rendition. You know, the massing's lower, and, and I think the key for at least the internal workings of the building is to have that top floor all at the same level, or at least be able to connect. Um, I think it gives us a lot more options for layout too, um, not confined. So, but I definitely like this a lot better. Sure, thank you. If I may, Mr. Chairman, please. Um, I just I just want everybody to be aware that in either case we're looking at pretty good disruption to this whole wing at the back of the building. Um, in this case, you know we're going to actually be dropping columns down through. But you know as the discussion went um, over the past couple of weeks, um, even just building over top uh, and spanning over it was going to cause significant disruption uh, to this area of the building. So. You know, when we do the budgeting, we're going to have to think about uh, the swing space for all of the people that work in that area and make sure that we can accommodate that, maybe utilizing you know, the old police building or, or some other solution. Um, that'll be a component of the, of the overall budgeting exercise. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Okay. More to um, follow, I assume. Matt, if I can interrupt just one second. Sure. Yeah. I, I was poking around looking at ambulance standards. Uh, most of them are falling in the, the nine foot two to 10 foot range. Um, there may be some taller ones, but I haven't come across them so far. So at the moment, we're looking okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, okay. So a little bit more um, discussion on the police station estimate and budget. Um, in particular, we went and pulled together a number of cost comparisons. So there's a lot to digest in this graphic, but what we essentially have is a number of different police stations in the top set in Wilbraham and Auburn, then there's a gray bar, and then the following ones are public safety. And the reason why we have a lot of public safety in here is there was more to choose from as far as um, CM at risk. Um, as you can see in the top, and this, in, th this indicates all CM at risk um, public construction for public safety and police stations in the Commonwealth since 2005, when chapter 149A became uh, a practice. And so you notice there's only been two, um, but there's only been one other standalone police station that's Malden. And, and what you'll notice with all the public safety or all the um, CM at risk projects is that they're not dictated based on their project size and scope. What we found is a lot of these smaller communities like Millis and Northampton and um, in Chatham, uh, they went the CM at risk route because, a, because they had a lot of familiarity with the process and they've had a lot of success with it on other projects in town. Um, so that's certainly something that's that's weighed on the committee's mind as part of this decision. And it's it's certain it's certainly a valid point because one of the requirements of, of the OIG application is the capacity for a municipality to, to, to complete the work under this procurement method and, and that's having the experience to do so and this town has that experience. So I think that that's a good fit. Um, 
you'll also see, so let me just go through what we're showing here. And, and that's basically these, these columns. You, there's the project name. We've broken out the population of each community that we're highlighting here and the date in which that project was procured. The building gross square footage. The next column is the construction cost from that date of procurement or estimated. Um, the Chapter 149A OIG list of, of projects shows estimated costs, so we couldn't really get the, the hard bid numbers on a lot of these. Um, we then have, we then broke out the cost per square foot for that project based on those two factors, the construction costs and the square footage of those buildings. And then what we wanted to do is, they're not really an apples to apples comparison if we're looking at a project that's 15 years old and that cost per square foot. So we went ahead and escalated that out to 2022 when we're anticipating this project. They're not anticipating when the project moves forward, but that's what our estimate carried. So we brought those numbers up and, and the way we got those escalation factors is Turner Construction publishes the average uh, historical escalation factor for the past 20 years. So we use that data to, to, to bring these numbers up to the current year. So it's, this is a pretty fair estimation of what these projects would cost when compared to our project. The next column is the project cost. So that's hard and soft costs. Uh, we also escalated that up. Um, and then the last column is its method of procurement. So chapter 149 would be um, your traditional design bid build and 149A would be CM at risk. Um, the way these are or organized in order um, is cost per, um, cost per square foot. Um, in the escalated column. So not so if you look at cost per square foot in, in, in where it's escalated, that's where we are in that in that yellow highlighted line. So what's that what that tells us is our project value, our overall project value is very efficient compared to a lot of the other municipalities. Our, we're getting a lot more bang for the buck in this project. And a lot of that has to do with what I talked about previously and, and police stations have several spaces that are very expensive and then there's lots of other spaces that offset those costs. We have a lot of office space, storage space, things like that. And that a lot of that is driving the offset and cost per square foot. So we're building a little bit more value into the project because of that. The other thing you'll notice is the building gross square footage. Um, and we're sort of at the top of the list on that. and and. It's not dictated on population. And we'll get into that on the next slide as to why our building is larger than other communities. Hey, Matt, um, just build on your comment uh, value of cost. Um, there's an echo. Um, Dighton, please, is one of ours. And that is a very small building, very inexpensive construction but the percentage of that expensive area that Matt talked about as compared to the inexpensive area of office space um, was very, very different than your building. You know, it, we were upwards of 50% of that building was, was either dispatch or prisoner processing. And so you can see it's reflected, even though it was a, a lesser uh, construction type, it actually ended up uh, costing more per square foot in the escalated value. So that proportion weighs a lot in terms of how you get value out of the project. We can, we can talk in more detail about um, some more of these projects specifically um, because each one has a, has, a, has a different story and a different set of constraints that, that are, that's driving the cost. One of the late additions is Dedham Public Safety. You don't have that in your packet that was, that was previously issued. We added that um, just yesterday evening, that's new data. And the project cost is something that we can't compare apples to apples to because it has an underground parking structure and some uh, remediation that's part of that number. Um, so there's always that sort of thing to balance um, when we're looking at these as comparisons, but but the real, the, the real thing to, to really look at is that 
the cost per square foot for this project is, is very reasonable compared to other communities. Now, I wanna go over just some things about what's driving the program. And we've talked about this in the past, but, I, but we never put the data to it. And what's driving the program um, larger than other similar sized communities. And there's um, three factors. Um, one is driven by um, public use and public amenities. The second is by specific divisions that your police department has based on its call volume and arrest record that, that is driving its staffing. And the third is um, future growth in future policing and making sure that our facility is accommodating um, proper training for, for, the, for the future of policing. So the first two items are, are really driven by that public use and that's the two conference rooms off the main lobby. Um, those are public use conference rooms that are offsetting the need at, at town hall and elsewhere in town. Um, and that is an ad of 800 square feet. We also have the 311 call center, the non-emergency call center. This is in other communities, but it's not in every police station. Um, my apologies. Uh, we're all running around somewhere, I'm sure. Um, and that's another 416 square feet. Um, your department has a traffic division, and, and that's simply driven by the, the staff and the number of um, traffic citations in, in accident reconstruction things like that. Um, so that's something that your previous police department doesn't have really. It's space that's sort of just scabbed together from other office space throughout the facility, but it's a need that you have because of the way, um, because of sort of the incidents that, that your community has. And, and so you have a full div division dedicated to that. And that's about 600 square feet. You also have the services division, um, which is something that is sort of scattered throughout the existing police station. And, and we're now dedicating space to that. Um, future policing, um, as part of the, the fitness multi-purpose room, half of that space is not dedicated to, but we'll call it a thousand square feet or half of that space to firearms training simulation and de-escalation training. So this is something that's becoming more and more popular you know, 20 years ago when we talked to police station, everybody wanted a firing range as part of their department. And and that's sort of falling out of favor. And it's, it's not something that's, but not every community supports and is, is sort of a, a, a unicorn when we do these police stations and we don't, we don't really do often, but something that is becoming more and more prevalent is these fire, firearm training simulators and de-escalation tactics simulators. So these are sort of video immersive environments where there's live firing simulation and you're doing live interactions that, um, with a simulation that's, that's driven by somebody else in a control booth. And, and it really gives you real time ways to interact with de-escalation and, and all sorts of different scenarios that, it, that an officer would, would come in contact with when on the street. And so this is the sort of training that we're really, that is really being driven um, to help aid in the future of policing. And, and this is going to set your department up to be sort of, on the forefront and, and a leader um, in that. So it, it's an asset that's gonna become more prevalent and more common in departments and that's why it's in here. You also have uh, the eight vehicle parking garage um, in this design and that's about 3,500 square feet. Um, not every department has that. You currently have that in your existing police station. So that's a carryover from, from what you currently have. And, Whenever we do a police station, we don't want to take away from or give them less than what they had in order to pre perform the services to the community. So we're carrying that over and, and, and that's part of this, this design. Um, and then on the second floor, we have about 1200 square feet of future growth space. This is sort of an unfinished box. If we were to compare it apples to apples and say, this is you know the dollar per square foot um, compared to the rest of the building, it's not going to cost that same value because it's going to be just one empty room that's gonna be drywalled with some, with some lights and some paint. But what that allows you to do is, you know, we have all these, this traffic services division, you know, we have all these different departments that 20 years ago, we weren't able to anticipate the need for Shrewsbury to have. And this allows us to have that expansion in the future without having to make a major addition. Um, and it, it sort of 
reduces the pain um, of, of these sort of unanticipated growths that are going to happen um, over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and so that, that's about 8,700 square feet, and that's about 20% of, of the building gross square footage that, that are these sort of special program items that are specific to this department in this town. And, um, and that's sort of what's driving the size of this in, when, when we compare it to sort of the same size police station or a similar size police station in a, similar, uh, di in a different community um, in the Commonwealth. Um, the last piece is just looking at project schedule. Um, we make these great graphics to show the whole schedule, but you can never read them when you look at them on these tiny screens. So I did break it out. So this is sort of the analog. Um, and then the next slide is, is a blow up of the graphic. So if we move forward uh, at fall town meeting, um, get a ballot vote uh, in November and then and then ultimately move forward with funding the project as a CM at risk um, project. We'd be looking at hitting the ground running um, December 1st with moving right into design development and getting all the details put together for, for this building. Simultaneously, as we do that, if, if uh, this committee votes to approve moving forward with the CM at risk procurement method, we'll be submitting at the same time our application to the Office of the Inspector General to procure the project that way. And we'll also be um, uh, soliciting for pre-qualification to construction managers at that point as well. That'll move us um, probably around late January, early February, getting into the interview process for the construction managers. Um, once they're on board, we'll be wrapping up design development end of February. That's when we're gonna be going for our design development estimate and, and, and balancing those um, analyses with the construction manager, getting their feedback on sequencing and detailing and things like that. And then while we start our final construction and bid documents, we'll be putting our early site package together. Um, those early packages will go out for bidding um, in June. Um, that'll put in as well as our site package. So that'll get us sort of moving midsummer into getting the, the new police station site cleared and ready for footings and foundations, getting those footings and foundations poured and set. And then in July, we'll be bidding out the rest of the trades, the filed sub bidders, and we'll be moving into full construction towards the end of August. Uh, pretty much about a year from now, we'll be getting into full construction and, and the building will start coming up from the ground at that point. Um, we're anticipating a 12 month construction process from there. So we'll be closing out construction of the main building um, the following September, early October. That moves the department out of the existing building and in end of November, um, early December. From there, uh, sort of depends on what we're going to be doing with the town hall. If we're going to be using the existing police station as swing space, we're going to be leaving it as is, and that's sort of where the CM um, demobilizes and moves out and we'll be doing the town hall work. Uh, if we decide to go a different route or the town hall addition or, um, uh, holds off for a little while, we'll be taking down the existing building, abating um, any hazardous materials, demolishing it, and then finishing up that sort of phase one scope of site work at that point. And then finishing all of that construction uh, mid 2023. So that's when we're looking at full project completion if we follow this schedule. Um, and then just the, the graphic um, Gantt schedule of that same information showing how um, all these different phases sort of sequence one after one after another. Um, the next slides that are in your packet are just a reiteration of the budget that we presented last time. So we don't have to go over that and I don't have to show any of that. We can just sort of open it up to any discussion. Um, and I also have the 3D model open. So if we wanna see anything else on, on site, all three buildings <coughs> um, are incorporated into that. So we can see sort of everything in context as it would look if all three projects are completed. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of information. Um, we always like to keep it light. To absorb. <laughs> Uh, any, I have several questions, but I'm going to open it up. Do any other committee members have any questions or comments? 
Uh, Pat Jomar. Sure, Joe. Um, so the only thing in just looking at this and playing devil's advocate uh, for the selling of the project, and I certainly completely understand the project cost estimates and everything, uh, what stands out with these numbers right here, obviously, is the building square footage. So um, <clears throat> obviously, to sell the project, we're really going to have to be prepared to justify the increase because I just looking at this list that you have here, picking out Lexington, Medford, and Beverly, um, you know, significant um, uh, size difference in those kind of similar communities. And I know everybody's different in what they need. Um, so I think really um, when I looked at this um, additional space, the thing that really needs to be addressed, particularly to the public is, the increase for the traffic division and a good um, definition of what the, the service divisions are and how they, they're played out and what, what's needed on those. Um, so just kind of throwing that out there and looking at um, moving forward, doing presentations, because I think people are going to look at that square footage, I think, and they're just going to it's that's that's a number of comparison to this to this list that's really going to jump out to the public. Any comment, Matt, or anybody I, else? I, um, I, I think when we start to formulate how we're packaging this to the public, I think one thing that, that the chief and I can do, and I'm actually I'm, I'm coming up there on Monday to, to meet with the chief, and we're going to be putting together a, a narrative on um, the, the need and the deficiencies with the existing building. Um, I think while I'm up there, chief, um, since I'm getting up there a little early, you and I can sort of talk about some of these things and how we can maybe pull together some stats and some data that, that can sort of highlight that. What I'll do is I'll, I'll get a description of each division, what they're responsible for. I have that. We can go over that now. Perfect. Just, just for conversation, the services division is actually administrative services division. So it's anything from grants to training to um, scheduling for the department and things of that nature. Okay, thanks, Chief. Um, thanks. Good. Uh, yeah, I just sorry about that. I just thank you, Chief. I appreciate the uh, the answer on that. Um, just just want to make sure we're we're spot on with where we are with uh, justifications because I know those, those questions will probably come up during during the process. Right. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Thanks, Joe. I mean, I think one of the things too, Chief, isn't the um, isn't the dispatch area being enlarged significantly, and you know, just the importance of of having that dispatch area. It's so critical to operations. Um, you know, I think that's another thing that people maybe don't understand in the general public. Absolutely. No, I'm going to go over that. I'll go over that with Matt as well on Monday. Okay. Very good. Yeah, and, and just a. Mr. Yeah, Penny, if I could. Please. I mean, just a reminder to everyone that at minimum, our plan with the police station is to provide joint dispatching, where currently we provide dispatching from uh, both the police station and the fire station. So uh, having the capability in the new station to essentially add another body and literally streamline communications from a physical standpoint is a goal of the project. So um, we can't lose sight of that option that's being provided through this project. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are several parts of this project that, that we can, you know, feature and talk about to the, to the public and, and really make it, you know, in, in terms of setting the, the need for it, number one, and number two, the fact that this is not a a building for the next 20 years, but it's for the next 75 years. And and I think that's really important. So if you look at the cost over that period of time, I think there's a lot of value built in here. With that, I did have yes, a question on the square footage. I mean, on the cost per square foot? Yep. So on your cost comparisons, Matt, you have 621 square feet. Is that all in? That's all furnished, all equipment, everything. Is that's what is that what's driving that number? The, that's that's the construction number. So that's the hard costs, which is that that top line that we had presented previously. The, okay. project, the project cost contains all that. 
Okay, because when I when I look at um, where the budget is broken out and the other presentation, you have new facility construction at four hundred and forty one ninety six per square foot. Could you just talk about the differences there? Sure. Yeah. So that that four forty one is is the building. If you were to just like take that out of a box and plop it on the site, um, the 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 rest of the pieces that add up to that cost per square foot is that. That's that twenty-seven million five twenty-six number. Yeah. So that's the contractor's overhead and profit, um, okay. the existing building demolition, insurance bonds. The additional cost for the CM at risk is above that four hundred forty-one a square foot. So it's all those added together that, that right. generate that. Number. To Joe's point, is, is, you know, this public information. I don't want people to think we've driven it from four hundred forty-one dollars a square foot to six twenty-one. Yeah, that's a fair assessment. It's it's. I had to use that number when we were doing this comparison because that's the apples to apples with all the other ones. But I think that's a, that's a fair comment. Thank you. And I, I did have a, another question on the the de-escalation training room. Um, and maybe again, maybe the chief can add in. Chief, is this similar to the trailer that that is brought in occasionally to um, to do training? Yeah. So this room, Patrick, would be used. We have two defensive tactics instructors on staff. Actually, one of them is nationally certified, and we conduct training twice a year. Currently, we use St. Anne's, I guess you would call it the gym inside St. Anne's. Mm -hmm. so there's room for that type of training. Also, we, there's new type of training up there, simulators. So you can actually do virtual training by putting it's – it's a type of kind of like a uh, – with, with, People use for computer games now. You can put it on, you know, put it on your head, and you can actually do, you know, uh, de-escalation training. You can do scenario-based training. So it'd be used for that type of training. Also, our uh, defensive tactics, which we do in-house. Okay, so you're not firing live rounds in in this facility. No, no, absolutely not. So it wouldn't be like the trailer. The trailer we use for live rounds. Okay. This type of training would be simulation. And just follow up on that. Well, this um since this room is state of the art and it's new and we can really, um, you know, promote it, will this be available to other departments for similar types of training? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be, it'd be similar to like our, our meeting rooms, you know, they could, they could book the room, they could schedule a time that they wanted to use it. We could also use, use for rad training or, you know, any type of training that other town departments may need or any sure. type of training that the community may need as long as you have it available. And what about other <laughs> departments? If they don't have these kind of facilities available, would, would we be making it available to them? We could do that, yes. Okay, very good. As well as as well as well our, our training room as well, we could, you know, make that available to other departments. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Any other questions out there? Hey Pat, I, I have I have one question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, how many elevators do we have in the building? One or two? Uh, one. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm asking is somebody asked me why there's no elevator from the cell room to the second floor, and I'm kind of at a loss to even understand why you'd need one. Yeah, there's no there's no second floor above the uh, above the cell area. That that would be a really good reason not to have one. But um, there's not there's chief. We're not going from the, the prison is not going from the first floor cell area up until the second floor. Anyways, are they? No. If if they if they did, they would potentially be going to the detective bureau for an interview, and they'd be escorted yep. appropriately. You know, by by staff, by the you know, Okay, so if they if if they needed an elevator, they'd take them over to the elevator and go up on the second floor, right? Exactly. We also have interview rooms that are going to be on that level as well that we'll have access to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one other. It, it's not. A, <laughs> it's kind of a question comment. Uh, some people. Uh, a few people have commented, why do we need a lunchroom and a training room? Um, why can't they be combined? Um, I think we need to be prepared to answer that, but I, I think it's pretty obvious if you're training. Um, I don't think you have lunch in the middle of the training. So uh, 
I think for the efficiency of the building, it, it's got to be that way. But these are the kinds of questions we're, we're starting to be asked. Um, so I, I think to your point about explaining why we have different rooms, uh, there's going to be questions like that that we don't anticipate. No, your, your answer to that question is exactly the right answer. Okay. Because it's not a it's not a it's not a police department only training room. It's it can be used by other people, and so right. Right. somebody in the community is using the training room now. There's no no place for the for the department to have their their lunch and have a break. And also, a lot of training activities may be going on with other staff while there's still shift going on. So you can't tell the shift you don't get to eat today because uh, because the training room is in use. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Um, Pat, Mac, Mr. Penny, no, I had, had a question sure. if I could. Sure. So I was wondering, and I may regret asking potentially, but I think it's important to know anyhow, is there the ability to add the number of sworn officers into the various buildings that, um, you know, to the to cost comparison chart? I guess I'd be interested to see if there's any driving factor or similarities or dissimilarities between the size of those departments that we're comparing ourselves to with the number of officers on staff? Um, I mean, here's, here's, here's what I'll, here's how I'll answer that. Um, I can get you the data on some of those. Certainly. The trick is I know what we use for a factor to sort of, um, look to the future and how we trend out um, future growth in a police department. So we can certainly put that together and say, this is how many officers were when we programmed it. And this is how we program the size of the building based on growth over 20 or 50 years. I can only do that for my projects. Um, I can't, I can't say that another community when they programmed out their police station did that same thing. Sure. There's plenty, there's plenty of times where, where departments have been constructed and they're and they you know they're a hundred percent budget conscious. It has to be as affordable as it can be today, and we don't care about twenty years from now. Um, and so those projections don't don't even get incorporated. Um, so it's it's a tough question to answer accurately, but we can we can pull some together to to see kind of where we are. Um, Jeff, what's that? What's the, isn't the, there's a sort of a rule of thumb for an average square foot per staff or something like that, isn't there? Well, for many, many years, we talked about um, 400 square feet per projected officer. So we would look at the projected um, staff size. And then as a rule of thumb, 400 square feet, we have seen that number creeping up over... I'm going to say the last six, seven years, um, I've seen it getting up closer to 500 square feet for sworn officer. Um, and most of that has to do with uh, increases in dispatch area and increases in training facilities. Sure. So I, I guess, Matt, I guess the natural follow up to that is it, can you drive that data on projects that you have done? So, the, and, and can we compare apples to apples that way? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll pull some numbers together and see how it's looking. Okay, thank you. Anything else regarding the budget or the cost comparisons? Okay, Matt, I, you said you had uh, all the renderings for the police station. I did have um, one question. We had talked a few meetings back about the mass of the building and I had asked about, you know, where the, where the Sally port was versus the other rooms. Was there any discussion around that in terms of rearranging that and trying to decrease the mass uh, or the appearance, not the mass itself, but the appearance of the mass. Right. Um, that, that I, that we still have yet to work out. Okay. Very good. I mean, I, I know there's time for things like that. But since we went, since mass was a, a discussion point around the town hall, I think it's fair to look at it with the police station as well. Yes. 
Mr. Pitney, could I just make one quick comment? Sure, Mr. Collins. Sure, thank you. I do think, uh, I, I just want to say I appreciate all of the data uh, that the project team has presented to provide comparison so we can kind of see where this project stands relative to other similar type projects and even the work to try to cost escalate to current dollars. I think it's very helpful. I think the uh, cost per square foot escalated, you know, puts us in a very comfortable spot. And I would agree with Mr. Morrow that, you know, the obvious questions are around the scale of the building. Um, obviously, coming from a school perspective and, you know, living in a community of continued growth over the last 25 years, um, you know, the, just a reminder to all of us about the risk of underbuilding um, and the financial costs of that, um, as opposed to, you know, the so-called risk of overbuilding. Um, and I think the, the financial uh, cost of underbuilding, of course, could be um, that we need to, uh, you know, five, seven years, you know, out, find that it's not enough space to provide the services that we want to provide the, to the community. And then you're looking at additions that aren't really well integrated into the original building um, and also the additional cost to mobilize and whatnot. You know, we're also in a very good period of time for borrowing money. Um, and if it were the case that uh, we did find ourselves that there were um, so-called excess space, and I know there's not, but if there were to be um, that, you know, this idea of other departments using uh, this space, um, like the conference rooms or training rooms, um, I think the space would be well utilized. So that's just kind of the counterbalance argument to, you know, is this, is this too large? There is a financial risk, a real financial risk of underbuilding as well. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I think that's a great point, and I think that should definitely be integrated into the message that we deliver out to not only at town meeting, but to the, um, the public as well. So thank you for that, because I agree. And I think everybody here is on board with that. It's just delivering that message out to the community. I think, you know, I'll just make one sp explicit analogy, and that is we, of course, opened up Floral Street Elementary School in 1997. There's lots of debate about the size of that school. And uh, a short, uh, I believe it was uh, three years later, um, we uh, built uh, seven additional modular classrooms onto two uh, elementary schools. So uh, that was the that was the underbuild uh, risk there. I was here for all of it, and my kids were my twins were split up for kindergarten and first grade. One was at Beale, and one was at Floral. Uh, as a result of. <laughs> that underbuild. So I think it's a very fair point. Anything else? All right, very good. So that, um, that takes us to a review and discussion around the special town meeting schedule. Mr. Mizikar, would you like to? <clears throat> sure, I'd be happy. So um, a little foot was added to the accelerator on the on the, the timing of town meeting uh, i think appropriately so given the um the critical need for uh, funding for the police station project and moving forward and i will augment and hopefully compliment uh mr collins's comments about the the cost of money or interest rates right now uh before i get into the schedule i had a call this afternoon with our financial advisor hilltop securities um and i originally laid out a very conventional bond schedule with them where we would do some bond anticipation notes in um, the first phase of this project in the december january time frame because bond anticipation notes historically are uh, much cheaper than uh, general obligation bonds when it comes to the interest rate when you look at a short period of time versus a 20-year period. Um, however, they told me that like every other thing in 2020, nothing is the same anymore. And uh, with our AAA bond rating, we could expect an interest rate of 1.9% if we were to hit the market um, in the December to January timeframe. Now, I did a backflip while driving my car down the pike when I learned we did we had a 2.3% interest rate on Beal just two years ago. So being able to get an interest rate of 1.9% is 
literally as close to free money as you can get. So um, I just wanted to, you know, fortify uh, Mr. Collins's comments about uh, the cost of money right now. And, you know, whenever you look at a $42 million borrowing, which is what this is targeted at as we move to town meeting, and you look at the difference even between 2.3% interest and 1.9% interest, you're probably getting pretty close to, you know, three quarters of a million dollars over a 20 year borrowing period that that, that little change. Um, I'll just remind you on a, a $56 million borrowing for the Beale project, uh, we projected a 3% interest rate and got a 2.3% interest rate. So seven, seven uh, basis points. And that saved the project $3.9 million. So uh, there is significant savings by, again, pressing the, the gas pedal to get this project lined up and, and uh, out uh, for bid, et cetera, and, and funding as soon as possible. So going back to the original intent of the agenda item, um, the Board of Selectmen voted last night to uh, set a special town meeting date of September 29th. That meeting is to be held at the high school field house. The only article on that uh, warrant is for the borrowing authorization for this project. And um, as is customary, the finance committee meet will hold a public hearing uh, one week from tomorrow on um, Thursday, September 17th, where uh, we will be looked to to make a presentation to them regarding the uh, financial and the physical attributes of the police station, explaining um, all aspects of it to them and seeking their approval and public input uh, during that meeting uh, from tomorrow. So again, uh, we have a short time frame ahead of us. I think it's the right thing to do and move forward in, in that fashion. Uh, followed thereafter, the Board of Selectmen will likely ask for the committee's attendance at their meeting on September 22nd as they uh, make their recommendation um, for this warrant article. And then we proceed the following week to the special town meeting again on September 29th at the uh, high school field house. So that's how the schedule lays itself out. Um, we'll have some other dates where we'll do some pre recorded um, meetings. Most likely it will just be staff. Perhaps Mr. Pitney will be involved in those as well, but we can keep the uh, committee fully apprised of our activities um, with regards to the special town meeting. But that's the basis of the schedule. Very good. Thank you. And Mr. Mizikar, at the Finance Committee hearing, will they be making their recommendation that evening? They will be, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Very good. Any questions around the schedule? There being none, I guess we can move on. Um, next on the agenda is review and discuss the November ballot question schedule. And who do we have up for that? I don't mind handling that. Mr. Okay. Um, as the committee may be aware, the Board of Selectmen voted in early August uh, in order to meet the Secretary of State's deadline to have uh, the second part of this funding authorization, which is to exclude uh, the revenues that are required to repay the debt from the provisions of Proposition 2.5, i.e. the ability to raise uh, the tax rate to cover the debt service for this project. Um, that will be included on the number, November 3rd uh, ballot, uh, presidential ballot. It will be a question that everyone will see when they get their ballots. Um, at the um, Selectman's meeting last night, the board voted to name uh, proponents and opponents, which is a requirement under statute uh, for the town of Shrewsbury in order to inform the voters of what the impact of a yes or no vote is on any ballot question. Uh, there has been a ballot committee that's, uh, that has been formed um, that is being chaired by uh, Michael Hale. Uh, it's called the, uh, uh, it's slipping my name, uh, Community uh, support for public safety or uh, something very close to that. Mr. DePaula may be able to correct me. And um, that group uh, will be offering the proponents comments. And there is no uh, opposition that has come to the board's attention through their call for uh, an opponent. And uh, therefore town council will have the unenviable task of writing the uh, opposing 
uh, comments uh, or what would happen if there's an overall. So um, that's really the, the ballot question is much more of a uh, private and less uh, public and building committee uh, related process. Although it is a critical step, the vote at town meeting would be a two thirds majority and the ballot question is a simple majority to exclude those revenues. So that's really the, the funding components to this. Our financial advisors are diligently working through that schedule that we agreed to this afternoon with a couple scenarios that I anticipate having in hand by the end of the week that will inform all those meetings next week and complement the uh, presentations that Tecton have developed thus far. Very good. Thank you. Any Again, any questions or comments out there? Okay, there being none. Um, looks next is set, set the day for our next meeting. Um, what are we looking at? Do we, do we want to wait until after the finance committee hearing or are we looking at meeting before next Monday or? Well, I, I might suggest that, you know, uh, since it is a virtual environment and somewhat ease of access, we could post, uh, this committee, uh, so those in attendance that wanted to be there certainly could be there and participate at both the finance committee's public hearing and at the board of selectmen's meeting on the 22nd of September. So certainly wouldn't be a requirement, but I think it would be most prudent to uh, post those. I'm sure the board of selectmen would do the joint posting regardless. So um, just keep those two dates in mind, both the 17th and the 22nd. And okay. then uh, at any time, I think we can have Alex reach out to the committee if, if there are any um, additional comments or questions or things that we need to discuss as a committee in advance of the meeting on the 29th. Okay, very good. Um, so invites will be going out to the entire building committee for these two meetings? Okay, yes. I, would, I would encourage everybody if your schedule allows, these are both seven o'clock meetings on those evenings. I would like to see everybody be in attendance if they possibly can. I think showing, you know, unified support for this project by having everybody in attendance is important. And I will certainly be there. I know that. Okay. Mr. Pitney, you just have a question, please. Please. Um, if, if there is a quorum of members present, I think this has to be, it would have to be posted as a joint meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. We Thank will, you. Yeah, we'll certainly handle that. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Anything else out there? All right. Good discussion this evening. I appreciate it. Um, a lot of good information. I think we've made some progress here. So things are starting to move along pretty quickly. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. A motion and a second to adjourn this, e this afternoon's meeting. When I call your name, please signify by saying aye. Maurice DePaulo? Aye. Uh, Chris Kristen, have you joined us? Are you? I thought I saw you in there at some point. She joined and then had to depart. Okay, away. very good. Um, Keith Baldinger? Aye. Holly Hook? Aye. Kevin Anderson? Aye. Patrick Collins? Aye. Joseph Morrow? Aye. Patrick Pitney? Aye. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.